And then slowly but surely over time, kind of around the Sempaternal era, they finally earned the approval of the gatekeepers. And now with Amo, it was all gone. Everybody hated him again. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about Bring Me the Horizon, who, in my opinion, are the single most important band in this entire generation of alternative music. I consider them to be the most innovative, influential, and forward-thinking band of the past 10 or 15 years, and sometimes I feel like they're almost single-handedly dragging the rock and metal scenes kicking and screaming into the future. I've talked about this in a lot of other videos, but in a lot of ways, I feel like the rock scene has grown very stale and almost like hostile to new ideas. And Bring Me the Horizon is one of the few bands in rock who are actually commercially successful and still willing to take wild, crazy chances with their music. Like if they put out a black metal EP next year, followed by a rap song, would anybody really be surprised by that? And what's really crazy is that you know that they would pull it off too, because this band just does not miss. So how do they do it? How do they go from being just just another one of the many unremarkable MySpace metalcore deathcore bands with a little bit of hype based on a cute frontman to being what they are now, a band that is not only selling out arenas and hitting the Billboard top 10 in multiple countries, but also taking these crazy chances with their music, playing everything from rock to pop to metal to like ambient noise. Well, I think I've got a pretty good idea and that is exactly what I will explain in this video. But first, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Well, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, didn't you already make a video about these guys? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, I did. It was actually one of the first videos I did that got any kind of traction, but that was three years ago and a lot has changed for the band since then. It's actually kind of crazy. They've evolved so much since then that I feel like a video from 2018 doesn't even tell half of their history. And so in this video, I do want to focus on the last few years of their history, but in order to understand where they are now, first, we have to go back to the beginning. Bring Me the Horizons started out back in 2004 in the town of Sheffield, England. And within less than a year, they had already put out their first EP called This Is What The Edge Of Your Seat Was Made For. And listening to it now, I don't know that anybody, including the band, would say that it's necessarily good. Like I wouldn't choose to listen to it now. But I will say that given the fact that they were like 17 years old and they did it, they had been a band for less than a year and by their own admission had really no idea what they were doing. Like I met them a couple years ago and asked him about it and Lee was telling me that the reason why the guitar tone on this album was so weird is because his amp was broken and he was like so new to being in the studio that he didn't even realize it. So is this EP great? No, it's not, but I will say that it's pretty damn good for what it is. You can definitely see the potential here. <laughs> They followed that up with their debut full-length album, Count Your Blessings, in 2006, which again was pretty rough around the edges. But even so, you could tell that this was like a good fucking band. Like whether you like deathcore or not, objectively speaking, Pray for Plagues is just a really catchy song for the genre. And there's a reason why people still want them to play it live. Count your fucking The production is obviously terrible, but the song itself holds up. And even then, just a couple years into their career, they were already getting a surprising amount of hype. Their EP got reissued and went to number 41 on the UK charts. They won Kerrang's Best Newcomer Award in 2006. And they were getting a ton of hype on this brand new website that everyone was talking about called myspace.com. And at this point, they were kind of lumped in with all of the then new deathcore bands that were coming up all over the place, like Suicide Silence, Chelsea grin, job for a cowboy, Whitechapel. And if you were around back then, you'll remember how everybody thought of those bands. They were either just totally ignored and written off as shitty MySpace music, or if the gatekeepers and media critic types ever acknowledged it, they did everything they could to just absolutely shit on it. They said that this was just trendy bullshit for poser kids, that it would never stand the test of time, that none of these bands would be around in two years, and certainly nobody would care about them. Obviously, in hindsight, the critics are wrong because every single one of 
those bands is still around and many of them ended up being quite successful and influential. But the point is that this was the start of a pattern for Bring Me the Horizon. Always a few years of what the scene was ready for. And by the time everyone catches up, they're on to the next thing. Which brings us to the next era of the band, starting with their 2008 album, Suicide Season, which was actually already a shift in sound for them. Don't get me wrong, it was still super heavy and all the deathcore kids loved it, but they had already evolved. I would say that this album was kind of like a heavier slipknot almost, like right on the border of metalcore and deathcore. And you could already tell that they had calmed down a little bit and started to focus more on writing actual songs rather than just being like balls out crazy all the time like on Count Your Blessings. They followed that album up in 2010 with There Is A Hell, which took that style even further, adding stuff like strings and these kind of ambient textures and stuff and going in more of like a post-hardcore kind of direction. And for a band that was kind of written off as the epitome of like trendy MySpace shit, they were already starting to prove those people wrong. There is a Hell actually hit the top 20 charts in both the US and the UK, which I would say is pretty fucking impressive. Especially for a British band to get that kind of a following in America is really hard. You can see how few bands have pulled it off since. So all of that was pretty impressive, but it was just a preview for what I would consider their real breakthrough album, which was 2013's Sempaternal, which represented their full transformation from like just this filthy, nasty, wild deathcore band, just trying to be as crazy and heavy and brutal as possible to something more like a polished, sophisticated rock outfit that was much more than just a scene band. And there's a couple things here kind of behind the scenes that I think were responsible for that. Number one, I think a big part of that was the addition of Jordan Fish to the band. That's the guy that you've seen doing synths and percussion live, but he's much more than that. I would say that he's kind of more like the band's own in-house producer in a lot of ways. He seems to have the most pop sensibilities in the band, whereas Lee comes from like more of a metal background. And I think the addition of Jordan's arrangement ideas is really what made Bring Me the Horizon break away from the pack creatively. They were doing stuff on Sempaternal that really nobody else in the genre had even thought of. And I remember when this album came out, the scene's kind of collective reaction was like, whoa, like everyone knew that Bring Me the Horizon was good, but this album was great. It was just on another level. Level. Even people like my friends who are old hardcore dudes that hate everything kind of just couldn't help but be impressed and admit how good this album was because it was just undeniable. Everything came together so well. Ollie had learned how to really be a singer, not just a screamer. Lee's riffs were as heavy and nasty as ever. And then Jordan's production and arrangements just kind of made it all come together in a way that leveled everything up. If you can't And I think another big part of this was Ollie going to rehab and getting clean. And they were always kind of known as a party band when they were younger, which is one of those things where it's cool and it works for you until suddenly it's not anymore. And you realize that either you gotta make a change or this is gonna potentially kill the band. And it does destroy a lot of bands. So huge respect to Ollie and the rest of the band for getting through this together and not only surviving it, but using that as fuel to make what was easily the best album of their career. I wanna say some of that I never I'd actually talk about before we wrote some paternal our fucking drug addict my band wanted to kill me my parents wanted to kill me my fucking brother wanted to kill me everyone to fucking kill me they wanted to fucking take me to hell but they didn't they stood by me they supported me through all that shit and we wrote Sempaternal because of it and people in the scene weren't the only ones who noticed how great Sempaternal was it went to number three in the uk number 11 in the us and to me with this album and the critical and commercial success of it they'd kind of unofficially graduated from the world of warp tour bands and into that kind of next stratosphere of mainstreamish alternative rock bands i don't know exactly what that means but it just felt like they had ascended to the next level that most bands from their scene were never able to. Maybe like All Time Low, and I can't really think of anybody else. And in 2015, they followed up Sempaternal with That's the Spirit, which I didn't personally like because it's a little bit too rock for me, but objectively, it was a really strong album. It kind of picked up where Sempaternal left off, but took things in an even more pop direction. And listening to something like Happy Song, which is so polished and slick and radio friendly, it's hard to believe that this is the same band that did Pray for for plagues. They had completely reinvented themselves.
Now, with that being said, they got plenty of negative feedback. There was definitely a segment of the fans that didn't like it. You heard plenty of the usual stuff from formerly heavy bands that end up going in a more accessible direction. You know, they went soft, they sold out. Why don't they sound like Suicide Season anymore? But still, in spite of all that, this album went to number two in both the UK and America, and it was official. They were now a legit mainstream rock band. Worlds apart from really just a few years earlier when they were still kind of trying to get their foot in the door in America and they were playing at like 3 p.m. on Warp Tour. <laughs> And if this was the peak of their career creatively or commercially, I still would have been impressed because they'd come so far in like 10 years. But this was not the peak, not even close. And this is actually where my previous video about them left off, which sucks because this is actually right where things start to get really interesting. To me, the real turning point in Bring Me The Horizon's career was their 2019 album, Amo, which was easily the biggest stylistic shift of their career. Like if you haven't heard it, it's basically like a straight up pop album that happens to have some distorted guitars kind of in the background, but they almost kind of feel more like synths or something. You need a taste of your own medicine. To say that it was a big departure would be a huge understatement. And I would actually say that it's my personal favorite Bringing the Horizon album because I like pop a lot, but it was not well received by their core fan base to say the least. They said the band was selling out, that it was Ed Sheeran pop trash with Beatles haircuts and blah, blah, blah. You can go read the reviews of it from back then and see plenty of examples of what I'm talking about. And so in some ways it felt like this album was kind of right back to where they started. Back in the MySpace days, like I said, the media critics and the metal gatekeepers and whoever else hated them because they were trendy bullshit for posers or whatever. And then slowly but surely over time, kind of around the Sempaternal era, they finally earned the approval of the gatekeepers. And now with Amo, it was all gone. Everybody hated him again. But here's the thing, and this is what to me impresses me about Bringing the Horizon more than anything, because there's plenty of bands who take chances and alienate their audience and kind of sabotage their careers. But with Bring Me the Horizon, they managed to pull off the combination of of these crazy huge stylistic shifts and yet somehow get bigger and bigger and bigger every time. Because as much as people complained about it, Amo went to number one in the UK and number 14 in the US. So basically for every butthurt metal fan that they lost, they got several more new fans. And so in the end, it was a win. And what I really, really respect is that they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that this was not going to be well received with your kind of typical rock and metal fan who freaks out whenever they hear something that's not double bass and screaming, but they did it anyway. They knew that this was going to alienate a lot of people, but they said, fuck it, let the chips fall where they may. And you might say that I'm giving them too much credit, but check it out. They actually have a song called Heavy Metal that predicted this exact reaction. I'm afraid you don't love me anymore. There's a kid on the gram in a black Dahlia tank says it ain't heavy metal. I also like how back then they started adding a medley of some of their old deathcore songs to their live set. Just as a little fuck you to all the people who said that they couldn't pull those songs off anymore. I would actually say that they play those songs better now than they did back then. <laughs> But anyhow, the reason that I say this is the most important album of their career is because this is when they showed that they were truly a post-genre band. That Bring Me the Horizon wasn't deathcore or metalcore or rock or pop or anything else. That they were a band who was gonna do whatever the fuck they wanted in whatever genre they felt like doing at any particular moment in time. They showed that with Amo and underscored it even further with the album that they put out later in 2019 called Music to Listen To, which is a really interesting piece of work. It's basically a collection of like lo-fi electronic pop songs, including a collaboration with Halsey, which I think really planted a flag in their willingness to go full on pop. And whether you like the music or not, maybe you're an old school fan that likes the heavy stuff. Either way, I think you have to respect that. They worked for years and years and years to get to this point, to finally get to the top of the mountain as a rock and metal band. Band. And the natural reaction for anybody who quote unquote makes it is to just kind of freeze in place to say, okay, this is what people want from us. We're having some success and we don't want to lose that. So we're just going to keep
keep doing more of the same because we don't want to alienate the fans and upset the apple cart. And I totally get that because honestly, that's how I feel. You know, as a creator, I worked so, so hard to build this channel to where it is that I'm afraid of losing it. And honestly, there's a lot of videos that I would love to make, but I don't because I don't think my audience will like them. And so really the truth is that I am no different than a lot of these rock bands that I criticize for being afraid to take chances. And that is exactly why I respect the fuck out of Bring Me the Horizon because they are willing to take those chances, even knowing that it's going to alienate a huge chunk of their audience. But they believe in themselves and their work, and they're not afraid to just say, fuck it. So that brings us to 2020, 16 years into Bring Me the Horizon's career. And if you thought that they were done doing crazy, unexpected shit, you would be wrong. Just when we thought that we knew what to expect from them, like, okay, they're not metal anymore. Now they're a pop band. We get it. They came out with their album Post Human Survival in 2020 which was a totally unexpected return to like old school metalcore. And it was really fucking good. To me, it just sounded like old school count your blessings era Bring Me The Horizon, but with their current level of musicianship and modern production. And for everybody who said that they couldn't do heavy anymore, well, they pretty much shut up all those critics because they sounded better than ever. It reminded me so much that song of like something that would have been on Count your blessings, but done a bit better and stuff. And since then, I feel like that is when their fan base pretty much let go of any expectations. Now it just feels like they're gonna do whatever they want with every new song, every new EP. You really never know what you're gonna get from Bring Me The Horizon. You just know it's gonna be good. This band just keeps getting better and better, which is so, so rare. Like their latest single, Die For You, feels super fresh and new to me. It's like this perfect fusion of everything that they've done before in their career from metalcore to pop and what's trending now in rock and alternative music all just kind of jammed together into one song that just feels right. I think the stuff they're putting out now is the best of their career. Like here they are almost 20 years into their career and it feels like they're just now coming into their prime creatively, especially compared to a lot of their peers from back then who ran out of steam 10 years ago, if not more. I've criticized the rock scene a lot for being stuck in the past and honestly, for good reason. Go look at any festival and you'll see that it's the same bands from like 15 or 20 years ago headlining or sometimes even worse. Like you see the Scorpions headlining a festival, a band that was in their prime in the 70s. Sometimes I feel like the rock scene just kind of stopped paying attention to the world in 2002. It's just been frozen in time since then, ignoring anything else that's happened at best or at worst, like actively hating on new developments, new genres, and new artists. And so I love that Bring Me The Horizon are the exact opposite of that. Not only are they taking chances with their music, but they also clearly still have their ear to the street. Taking bands like Lorna Shore out on tour, collaborating with a lot of younger artists recently, like Poor Stacy, Dane, Youngblood, and my friend Jarris Johnson, who is amazing. Check him out if you haven't. And like this week, they're playing a show at the Whiskey in LA, which is like a tiny little venue with Jarris Johnson and CU Space Cowboy, which is a band that's bringing back that mid 2000s metalcore kind of sound that you heard on the first Bring Me The Horizon EP. So they're really like combining the past and the present in a way that I think is super cool. And listen, they don't have to do any of that. They've made it to the top, right? The easy thing to do, arguably the smart thing to do would be to pull the ladder up behind them, to just say, fuck you to the next generation of artists like it's not our job to put you on nobody put us on good luck like how does it benefit them to collaborate with tiny artists like Dane they do that stuff because at their core they are artists they're innovators that want to support the next generation of artists and people doing what they did taking risks and moving alternative music forward whether the world is ready for it or not so what's next for bring me the horizon honestly who the fuck knows like I said earlier I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they did like anything from rap to black metal to chip tunes, maybe even in the same song. So I have no idea what they're gonna do, but whatever it is, I'm stoked for it and I hope it pisses people off and pushes the boundaries of the genre just like they've been doing since 2004. And thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I've used Squarespace for almost a decade now for my personal website, and I genuinely think their product is fantastic. You can connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content, manage your members, 
members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights all in one easy to use platform. And use their powerful blogging tools to categorize, share, and schedule your posts as well. And they also do e-commerce. Just go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash the punk rock MBA to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Check me out on Discord and Twitch. And as always, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get every one of my podcasts a week early. There's members only channels in my discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways. I do Q and A's. There's a way to have me review your music or video or artwork or anything else you want to get my eyes and ears on. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.